Thank you for tuning in to Grieving Voices. I'm your host, Victoria Volk, and today with me is my new friend, Maha Bodhi. And Bodhi. Uh, Bodhi. Let me yeah, start over. Okay. okay. Bodhi. Okay. Like Brody, but without the R. Bodhi. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Grieving Voices. Today, my guest is Maha Bodhi. And after surviving a brutal upbringing of being enslaved as a female in Yemen, forced into arranged marriage twice, surviving multiple death threatening situations, and two civil wars before arriving in the U.S., Maha found her freedom and true self through the practice of ancient yogic, ancient yogic and modern neuroplasticity techniques. She is a living example of the hero's journey and is dedicating her entire life to spread the transformational te techniques that have saved her life. Thank you so much for being here. And apparently I can't talk today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me, Victoria. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. And I initially met you, um, I had gone to, for those, I mean, obviously listeners, listeners won't know this, but I had gone to a women's business summit and you were one of the presenters and you had shared your story and I was just captivated by your story. And I thought, gosh, I need to have her on the podcast. And here we are. Yes, here we are. Yes. Thank you for having me. I, it was so, um, just so refreshing to see you in that summit and to see all the incredible women and the incredible work that um, that organization is doing. You know, I was just really impressed. And so you tour the country and go mm -hmm. all over speaking and things like that, but that wasn't always your life. And I imagine what shaped your life and the work that you're doing today has been your life experience. And can you take us back in time? Absolutely. Like you mentioned, Victoria, in your intro, I did come from a very kind of traumatic background. Um, my Both of my parents are from Yemen, and it's a very poor and undeveloped country. You know, 50% of the population it lives below the line of poverty. You know, they don't even, most people don't even have access to clean water or basic human necessities, any sort of appropriate health care. And women are treated very, very poorly in terms of their goal. The purpose of a female really in that country is to serve her husband. And a, and a man is allowed to have up to four wives. They call them like sister wives and they all live in the same house. And arranged marriage is very common in that region. And not only in Yemen, in multiple Muslim countries. And um, even till this day, it's still practiced, the arranged marriage, where really the kind of you, your parents, mostly the father, it's a male dominant culture where the father owns the daughter and then a potential husband will come and propose. And it's kind of like a business deal. They shake hands and there's a dowry involved, a lot of money that the potential husband pays the father. And then the father hands off the, the female, his daughter to the new husband. Uh, in most cases, they don't even ask the woman permission if you her consent, if she wants to marry this man, you know, they show her a photo and this is who you're going to marry and they meet for the first time in their wedding night. And so a similar, you know, scenario happened to me not once but twice. And um, it was very traumatic. You, you know, one of the husbands was very violent and tried to kill me. And because I came from a very unstable family, I also, there was abuse in my home. So we, the whole country of Yemen is a very, there's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of civil wars. There's tribal wars. There's international wars. There's like five different wars going on at the same time. And, uh, and in addition to that, there was violence inside of our home. My mother was extremely violent physically, verbally, you name it. Um, and so I was used to violence and it was kind of my normal. And so when I married, especially the second husband, and I was forced into that marriage and he was violent and he was trying to kill me and a machine gun in my head and a sword in my throat and these like dramatic scenarios that you only see in, in you know, Hollywood movies. And for me, I, you know, it wasn't that extreme because I was like, okay, do I go back home and you know, somebody's going to kill me there, or do I stay here and die here? So those were kind of were my options. So it was a very extreme, extreme situation. But in that moment, when you're in it, 
Um, it's now that I look back now that I'm here and I'm safe and I've healed and I've matured, I look back and it literally feels like it happened to somebody else. It feels like a movie, uh, what I went through. And I don't like the human spirit is just so incredible and so resilient. And I, and I look at myself, I'm like, wow, how did I survive that? You know, and, and still move on and still come here and, you know, it's a long story. My father was a diplomat. So we there, that was kind of my key, my window to freedom because, because of his job as a diplomat official, his job required him to travel and to move every four years to a different country. So we would kind of go back and forth. I was born in Russia and we lived in Rome and Italy. That was my upbringing. And we lived here in Washington, DC. And my father worked for the embassy there for four years. And so kind of had a taste of what life outside of Yemen looks like. And that's why kind of, I knew inside of me that there's another way, there's another way of living. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually my father had to retire. I went to school in Romania and I decided uh, he was supposed to retire. And the last station that he was as a diplomat was in Bucharest, Romania. And I knew that this was it. If I go back to Yemen for good, you know, I will die. Either somebody will kill me or I will kill myself. And so I decided to start applying for a graduate school here in the United States. I saw some of my Romanian classmates do that. And it was, I was like, aha, that's my key to freedom. And I just started applying and I got accepted. And, you know, it was truly nothing short of a miracle that, you know, I had I convinced my dad to let me go to come here and get my master's degree in organizational behavior. You know, I really used school as an excuse and um, and he was able to let me go and I came here and, uh, and I knew, you know, the moment I landed, the moment I stepped on American soil was the first time in my life that I was free, that, you know, I didn't have to answer to anybody. I didn't have a curfew, you know, I was in my twenties and, and I was like, no one's calling me. No one is looking over my shoulder. I can go wherever I want. I can wear whatever I want. And that's kind of where my healing journey began. I mean, it's hard to believe that that still happens or is still happening to people, to women. And I can't imagine like getting like the person that you've become, right? Like how what did that look like for you? What did that healing look like? And also, I'm also curious, how old were you when you were first sold for marriage? Like, what is the typical age? Yeah. So, you know, I was 19, my first arranged marriage, but truly, Victoria, mentally, I would say I was 10 years old because of the lack of education, the lack of exposure, the lack of maturity, uh, there's there was zero sexual education. I I did not know what sex was or how it works or what a man and a husband do in the bedroom, and so I literally was a child in my head. Even though I was 19, I was so scared and terrified. All they told us is it's going to hurt a little bit, but then it's going to be okay, and eventually you're going to love him, and you know just have kids right away, and especially have a boy because that will increase your value and. Uh, literally that was all the sex education that I got. And so I was terrified. Uh, and also I'm with a stranger all of a sudden, and there's a complete like segregation between the sexes in that culture. Men and women do not socialize whatsoever. Um, you know, they cover up the woman from head to toe. And then all of a sudden on your wedding day, here you go, this is your husband, you know, go in, be intimate with him. And it was, it was just like insane. And um, so that was, that was, that was a lot. And then it, it was two years apart between my first and second. So literally the first arranged marriage, I only stayed 30 days and I was playing hide and go seek with this man for those 30 days. I was sleeping most of the nights in the bathroom floor, locking myself, you know, because I did not want to have sex with him. And that, and I never did. I just hid in the bathroom for 30 days. And then eventually I ran back to my parents' house and then they locked me up because now I brought shame to the family because that's so taboo in that culture. And, and I tamed like the whole family reputation and, and that was it. So I, I was locked up for one year and there was negotiations of the divorce. They were trying to bully me back into the marriage. Um, and I, I, I really was fierce, you know, now looking back, I was standing up to the most powerful men in, in a corrupt country, you know, 
that man that I married, his father was uh, the prime minister of, of our country. And, um, you know, in that kind of corrupt environment. And I was saying no to those men. I'm like, I'm not going back. I don't know where I had that <laughs> ferocity from. Uh, and I, and so they locked me up in my parents' house, literally solitary confinement. And for one year, I could not even see my own sisters that lived in the same house with me. At one point, I remember I opened the door to go to the bathroom and I see my little sister. And last time I saw her, she was crawling. She couldn't even walk yet. And now she was like, bouncing around and walking. She's grown and I didn't even recognize her and we live in the same house. And so I was losing my mind and, and I was literally starting to hear voices in my head. And, um, and then after the divorce was finalized, it took a year, they forced me into a second arranged marriage, like right into it. And at that point, I was so desperate that I thought, okay, maybe it's better, you know, to get out of this, you know, jail that I'm in. And maybe, maybe this guy will love me and be kind to me and I'll have a better life than I'm having right now. And so I was kind of optimistic about this one. And he ended up being extremely violent. He was the one with the machine guns and the swords and locking me up. And, and, and that was where sexual abuse came in. And he, because I was trying to do the same thing that I did with my first husband and, and avoid you know, sexual relations with him and he wouldn't have it. So he was forcing himself and, and on me and it was pretty much rape, you know, even though we, you know, we were married, if you will, but I wasn't, con you know, I didn't consent to this marriage. And, um, and same thing, I stayed there. I stayed with him for 40 days because, you know, I, I gave him 10 days more because I was just so terrified of, you know, doing it twice. And but it really was death or life in this situation because of the uh, how violent he was. And I was like, you know what, if I'm going to die anyway, you know, just I'm just going to go back to my parents house and see what happens. And and that's when my father it, it's interesting. I call this divine intervention because my father was supposed to retire. He was at the end of his career. The traveling was over and we were in Yemen. And and all of a sudden, my dad gets one last final diplomatic mission to go on to go to Romania and Bucharest and you know be the ambassador uh, for our country in that in, in Romania and my dad just because the situation was out of control my dad just grabbed me and he said come on just I'm gonna go to Romania and you come with me and so that's how I went to Romania and I started going to college because I, I wasn't doing anything I wasn't going to school you know I was just being bought and sold left and right and locked up. And so I started going to school, I went to business school, and things kind of slowly began to uh, lighten up for me, I went to school. And then the final year when my father was this time for real, he was supposed to retire, uh, I applied for graduate school and came to the United States. And you asked me what was this healing journey, and you see me now, you know, doing the work that I do and touring the country, like you said, and I'm writing my memoir and I'm leading yoga retreats and I, you know, work with fortune 100 and 500 corporations. It's not overnight, you know, and I know our culture has this like quick fix, this before and after picture. It's not like that. It was a process. It was years and years of intense healing, therapy, yoga, meditation, inward reflection, and a lot of self-study, I came here, you know, I had to figure out who is Maha outside of all that chaos. I never had a, a moment to, to, to know who I am. I never made one decision in my life up to that point. I was 25 years old when I came to the United States and I never, you know, bought a dress or never, you know, get, got to decide, you know, where to go or what to eat or, you know, my bedroom, I remember we would like, because we were traveling a lot, like I would, can I choose my room? Like, no, you don't get to choose your room. You don't get to choose any, everything is bought for you. Everything is decided for you. Even my haircut, even like the littlest thing, every decision was made for me. So here I am a grown woman. Now I'm in the land of the free. Everything is supposed to be amazing, right? But no, because internally, 
I don't know how to make the simplest decision. I don't know how to process information. I don't know how to behave like a grown woman. I remember I had to buy a mattress because, right, I just moved here. That's the first thing you do. You buy a mattress to sleep on. And I did not know how. To, I've never had a bank account in my life. I did not know how to pay for the mattress. The, the cashier had to show me how to write a check. And he would tell me like, pay in the order right here, sign here, put the date here. And I was so proud of myself when I did that. I thought I achieved something incredible. Um, and uh, I didn't know how to put gas in my car, all these things. So I had to learn um, step by step by step. And uh, yoga played a big, big role in my healing. And it really changed my life. And that's why now I'm so passionate about helping other people and sharing the techniques that helped me because they work. If it worked for me, literally coming from under a rock, English is not even my first language. And now I'm doing what I do. I think anybody can do it. If you have the will, if you have the determination and you put in the work, it is possible. Wow. It was like you were a 25 year old infant. I'm sure exactly what it felt like in a lot of ways. Yes. And, and really vulnerable to being manipulated and taken advantage of again. And so did you like, where, how did you even know where to find support when you first came here? Like how, what did that look like? (laughs) You know, I was so excited. And so I fell in love with America and the American culture. And uh, because of when we were traveling with my father, one of our stops was in the United States, it was in Washington, DC. And we lived there for four years. And I started kindergarten there and I studied up to third grade. And me and my sister was me and my older sister were kind of like two years apart. We got hooked. It was our favorite country of all the countries that we lived in. And we just fell in love with America. And then when we had to move away because, you know, my dad continued to travel, we were heartbroken and we never got over it. It was like falling in love and you never get over it. And so we would move to other countries and we would watch, you know, American sitcoms, Saved by the Bell, Full House, all these things. We were so immersed in American culture and so kind of resisting, you know, we were in Saudi Arabia and we were resisting that culture. We're like, no, America's like so much better. And so we, we always were dreaming of like America was the dream. And so when I came here, it was literally like, I remember I called my sister, I just landed and I was in San Francisco and I called her. I'm like, I'm in San Francisco. And she's like, wow, you did it. And she's like, just live the dream, live the dream for both of us. Cause she got arranged marriage, you know, and into that, you know, path. And she already had two kids. And, and so she was like, you know, just do it, do it for the both of us. And so what motivated me when you said like, how did you, I was so excited. I was literally living my dream and i was like i'm here and anything is possible here you know all those restrictions and chains that i had were gone and i realized now it's up to me now it's you know me and me all the excuses that i had are gone so it's up to me what i do with this freedom what i do with this opportunity and so i just you know sought, you know, therapy, that was number one, I would say number one was therapy, I knew I needed healing, I would have terror nightmares. You know, I suffered traumatically from PTSD. I mean, I didn't even know I had PTSD, I would just have these nightmares. And so I I went to therapy. And, and it went from there, you know, therapy really, really helped me break down how your past, uh, you know, is still showing up in your future and kind of shapes the lens of how you view your your world and, and your life, right? Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate said it. he's an incredible um, physician and therapist and he's holistic. He's, his work is incredible. But he says, uh, your mind shapes your world. But before that, your world shaped your mind. And so that's why, you know, I talk a lot about manifestation and manifesting your best life in my work. But in able to tap into your innate power of manifestation, become the creator of your life experience, you have to undo, you have to unlearn, you have to heal um, what was done to you, especially if it was a negative thing, the old tape, the old limiting belief. All my life, I was told that I was unworthy. You know, my mom would literally step on me. I'm like in a fetal position when I was young and she would put her foot on my back and and would tell me like, 
you are worthless. You are nothing, you know, and, and I'm being like, I, I'm not, I'm trying not to be vulgar here on your podcast, but she would say a lot of more aggressive things um, than just that. And so those things shape your mind. And I carried that with me all my life that I am worthless. Like who's going to want to look at me? Who's going to want to hear me? Who's going to want to be my friend? Who's going to give me a job? All these things, I carried those with me. And then they impact all the other, you know, areas of development in your life, your career, your finances, your relationships. Um, And so therapy helped me kind of see that. Um, And then... uh, but I felt like it, I plateaued. I reached a point where I just felt like I wasn't progressing at the rate that I wanted to. And that's when yoga kicked in because I, I love therapy so much, but you're only dealing with the in- intellect part of us. And there's a whole other part that is the body that is not tapped into therapy, unless it's a holistic therapist. Um, but um, that's where yoga really came in. What does it feel like to feel safe in your body? How does it feel in your belly? How does it feel in your heart? How does it feel in your legs? And so those things to embody, to be in body, to feel the qualities that you want to cultivate. And the the beautiful news is that, you know, it's possible. You can cultivate those qualities just through your intentions and being mindful. Um, The brain is malleable. The brain is plastic. It's a muscle just like any other muscle. And we know now through research, through neuroplasticity, uh, a lot of studies have been done in Harvard at the Lazar lab, the impact and benefits of yoga and meditation and what it does to the physical structure of the brain. They take the brain and they scan it before and they scan it after, you know, an intensive yoga and meditation program. And they saw that you increase gray matter through these modalities and through these practices. And what does that mean? What does gray matter mean? You know, I'm a little nerdy and I don't want to confuse people. All that means is that you activate parts of the brain that correspond to hope, optimism, uh, joy, and uh, you just start to make different decisions and you start to have a different view of life. So much came up for me as I was listening to you and I my eyes started to well up when you were talking about what you your sister had shared with you and I just thought oh my gosh like you're not only in a foreign country or you you were familiar with America but you left your family everything. behind everything mm-hmm. behind that you knew um so there's I have a two part question um if you don't mind going there yeah. but mm-hmm. did you ever think about changing your name or is is Maha Bodhi your birth name, first of all? And then secondly, um, are you still in relationship with your family? I'm glad you asked that question because a lot of people ask me that question. So my first name, Maha, is my given name. It's a very common name in uh, Middle Eastern countries and Arabic speaking countries. And it was... Um, It means in Arabic, it translates into big, beautiful eyes. And that's why my parents named me Maha. And so when I came fast forward to the United States and I'm actually in my yoga teacher training and it's my first day of teacher training. And the teacher asked me, can you introduce yourself to the group? And I said, hi, my name is Maha. And he said, do you want to tell them what Maha means? And I said, oh, it means big, beautiful eyes. He's like, Yes, but in Sanskrit, it means the great. And I had no idea, Victoria, that it meant that in Sanskrit or it had a meaning in Sanskrit. And everybody looked at me and they were like, whoa, you were destined to be a yogi. And, you know, it's like Mahatma Gandhi or Maha Yoga. It means the great. And so that was kind of one of those, you know, universal signs that I, I like, I feel like the universe gives us clues, 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 like this is to nudge us in the right direction. And so that was the first thing. My last name was my family name, which is al And I did change it when I became a U.S. citizen. And so I became a U.S. citizen in 2018. And uh, I, I didn't have any intention to change my name. And I was I get getting uh, naturalized and my immigration lawyer, she told me, uh, I was filling up the form and she said, uh, click here, do you want to change your name? And I said, oh, 
And she said, this is the easiest way to do it, like the fastest and easiest way. Just check that box and write whatever name you want. And I was like, I actually do want to change my last name because I felt like I was a completely different person. I had just completed my yoga teacher training and I became this yogi. And I, and you know, when you, when, when you are expecting a baby, you have like nine months to figure out what you want your baby's name to be. Or some people even know that beforehand, they really thought it through, they did research and I didn't have time. And it was like that moment. And I just, it came to me, just Bodhi came to me. And uh, Bodhi means the, the enlightened ones. It's uh, the Bodhi tree where the Buddha sat under the tree and he became awakened. And I felt like I was at that moment, I was going through these journeys and I was having these awakening experiences that were so, so powerful. And I would share them with, with uh, my colleagues during teacher training. And I'm like, did you feel that? Did you? And they're like, what are you talking about? We didn't feel any of these things that you're talking about. And so I felt like I was having a unique experience um, and so I literally just wrote down Bodhi, not honestly, I, like I said, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. And now, so then my friend told me, she's like, oh, so now you are the great enlightened one. I'm like, oh my God, no. Like that sounds very egotistic. I, I don't see myself that way. You know, I'm just a human in progress like everybody else. But, um, you know, um, I think it called me, the name kind of called me. I had actually looked your name up before. Yeah. Um, business summit. Yeah. Cause I was curious yeah. of the, if I figured there was some sort of meaning behind. Yeah. Those, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the other part of my question too, was, are you still in communication with your family? You know, unfortunately, no, I had to sacrifice that relationship and able to move forward in my life. Uh, it was very difficult. I slowly be transformed. You know, I call, I call myself, there was Yemen Maha and then there was American Maha and then there was Yogi Maha and the transitions were very, uh, extreme and it was difficult for me. I would talk to my parents initially when I first moved to the United States and I would call them and I would talk to my sisters and talk. And what I realized is that every time I spoke to them, I had to pretend that I'm still that old Maha for them. Mm -hmm. And I had to really hide who I am. And it was painful. It felt like self-betrayal. And, uh, you know, also it was reminding me of, of, you know, the past traumas and I was on this healing journey. And so I realized that if I really, really want to heal and, and become my fullest expression and my fullest potential, that there's a sacrifice that needs to be made. And, and I did, and it wasn't easy, but I, I believe that it, it was, it had, it was necessary. And that's a part of grief that a lot of people um, resist is creating yes. those boundaries and yes, really being able to have the, to feel empowered enough to say, no, I need to walk away from this relationship. It's not serving me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, so tell us about the work that you're doing now and your mission. Yeah, you know, when I came here, uh, I I just wanted to be an American, just like everybody else. So I'm like, okay, what do Americans do? Americans get a job and, you know, work in corporate America. And so that's exactly what I did. And I just got a, you know, I studied, I got my master's degree in organizational behavior. And after I graduated, I found a job. Um, I worked in the headquarters here in Los Angeles for direct TV. And I worked as a leadership development trainer and coach. And I was delivering like classroom style trainings. And uh, I liked it, you know, I didn't mind it. So I just, I kept going and I kept doing what I was doing, but yoga was always my happy place. So I realized like after work, you know, I was still copying whatever American culture was doing. So after work, everybody goes to happy hour, everybody. And I liked that for a little bit, but then I realized that, you know what, I'd actually rather go to yoga after work instead of at happy hour. I feel better, I sleep better, I wake up better. And so yoga was always my happy place. And then I just kept going for years and years until one day I decided just to take it to the next level. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to go to yoga teacher training. And I signed up and uh, I thought it was going to be a hobby. I thought I was going to teach a yoga class at the park on a Sunday. Um, that was really my intention. But then the first day, 
Victoria, I promise you, the first day I stepped into that room, I knew, I knew that I was in the right place, that I belonged, and that my life was going to change. And for the first time in my life, I felt understood. I felt that this is a language that I speak. And uh, I, I just knew that this was what I was meant to, to do and, and who I was meant to be. I was never good at school. And I struggled a lot with, you know, academia. And when I was in yoga teacher training, I was the smartest girl in the training. And I never, and it was so refreshing and surprising at the same time. Like when a teacher asks a question, I'm the one raising my hand. You know, I always say like Monica from my friends, like, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> like I'm the annoying student. And I never was that student. I started to realize that the other trainees were coming to me for advice. And, and we're telling me, oh, you're the best one. Only you can do this. Can you please teach me? And it felt like I have something to offer the world. I have value, like for the first time in my life. And uh, it was very rewarding that I, I have something, I can be of service to others and I can help make a difference. And, and I never looked back. And, you know, I, would, I will say that I probably wouldn't have the courage to completely quit my job and just become a yoga teacher. But what happened was that's another clue from the universe that I got certified mid-December. It was December 17th. And then January 1st, like two weeks later, I got certified. I got my yoga teacher certification. And then two weeks later, I got notice from my company that I'm being laid off. And the whole team is being laid off, not just me. They lay off a lot of people. It's part of their uh, downsizing process. And it was just our time, you know? And everybody was crying from my team. What am I going to do? Oh my God, my job. You know, they have mortgages. They have. And I was relieved. And I knew, I was like, I see you, universe. I see what's happening here. I know that you're telling me to go this way. And I never shed a tear. I never was upset. I, I felt so light. And, you know, they give you a severance. And they, I'm, like, I, I'm like, all right, I just took that severance. And I ran and I never looked back. And I started building my yoga business and building my work. And, um, and it just unfolded. You know, I just started just teaching yoga in a yoga studio in a classroom. And then because I had a huge uh, corporate network, you know, for my corporate life, my friends were, what, what is this yoga you speak of? Like, what are you teaching? Can you come to our company and maybe talk about it and, and share it? And as you know, my, my background being a leadership development train, trainer and holding, you know, that classroom type of training. So I kind of bridged those two worlds together and I created my own formula, which is, you know, just from different schools of thought. So I combined the ancient wisdom, healing, yogic techniques with the corporate, you know, uh, cutting edge best practices and efficiency and agility with the science of neuroplasticity. And so I created, I created my own formula. I call it the high performance mind. And now I, you know, I go to corporations and I deliver trainings. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I do inspirational speaking engagements, um, where, where you saw me at the Women Business Summit, where I just talk about my background and my experience. So that's kind of how it's shaped. Um, and it's, you know, from, from trauma, from a very intense, you know, difficult situation. So that's why I always say, you know, these traumatic experiences, they can break you down or they can break you open. And it's really up to you. It's your decision what you make of it. The poet Rumi said, the wound is where the light enters you. And so are you going to open to the learning instead of slipping into victim and being, why did this happen to me? You know, which one is better? Like, think about it for a moment. Well, and you might be there for a time and it's exactly, you know, you're, you're going to sit with all of that and the overwhelm Absolutely. of it all, but not to stay there and, you know, and just wake up and just choose better for yourself. Yes. So, and not to, go, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. It's just what you touched upon, what we call in, 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 the, in yoga, spiritual bypass. We don't want to bypass that trauma or that difficult experience. You actually want to hold space for it and be a container. So you're not um, dismissing that pain or dismissing that part of you. That's when we create disconnect. You actually want to integrate 
all parts of you, that it all belongs, the wounded part of you and the and the, the inner child part of you, you know, and even the parts of you that you don't really like, you know, maybe it's anger or jealousy or, you know, that part of you also belongs and, and the loving part of you and the light part of you, all of it. And once you become whole um, and that that's really when you tap into your full power and you're able to live your whole life. Do you seem to draw people to your work that have experienced trauma? And is that a big part of your yoga practice today? Like, do you work one-on-one with a lot of trauma? You know, it's interesting. I'm not a therapist, so I don't think it's my place to, to do that. But I do notice that people gravitate towards me, that pe- not just people who went through trauma, anybody who wants to reach their fullest potential and highest expression, you know, the dreamers, you know, the rebels, the people who want to uh, follow the path of least resistance, um, which I call like go with the flow. You want to be in alignment with yourself. You want what you feel is in align with what you say and what you do show up as your best self. Uh, and so those are the kind of people, uh, I, like I said, I'm not a therapist, even though I understand trauma very well. And I see, I can see it very clearly in people, but I don't have um, the skill set to walk somebody through it in depth. They probably uh, will be better served by seeking a professional. I know that you re- you did a piece in an HBO documentary. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? You know, that was kind of part of it's it's still in production. It's not out there yet. But what happened is that I did a, a one of my inspirational speaking engagements um, in Beverly Hills, and uh, they there was a lot of media there, and uh, you know, a production company saw me and. The, they're female to own, they're called She TV, and they reached out to me and they said, we want to film your story. And they're doing a HBO docu-series, which is every episode is uh, focused on one story. And they came to me and we filmed it. And uh, I don't know where it is right now. It's kind of still in production. Okay. Yeah. Well, if it comes out before, you know, your, your episode actually airs, I'll put that in the show notes. But yeah, please keep me up to date on that. Yeah, great. And what, what's next for you? You know, I'm just, you know, I'm continuing to evolve and grow in my work. I'm leading international yoga retreats, which are uh, tremendously transformational because you kind of step away from the noise of your day to day life. And, you know, a retreat is to retreat within. And so we are away from all that and you're in a new environment and we do yoga twice a day. And uh, I really have seen people transform in front of my eyes. And it's, it's truly magical if you if you're willing and open to allow healing to occur to allow transformation to occur uh, and i always say like the more you're willing to surrender the degree of your surrender is equal to the degree of your success and so the more you resist you know the more you get stuck you know emotions their energy in motion right they're designed to come pass through and let go and it's when we hold on it's when we resist and when we grip and we become identified by that story and that pain that's when we get stuck and really yoga is mo- moving your body you're literally expanding your body you're stretching yourself because when you are in pain you contract the body right you physically contract the body you can see it you make a fist with your hand you close your ribs your fidgeting, you're tensing the body. So the energy is not able to flow freely in the body. And yoga is kind of a counter for that. So you're stretching your body, you're breathing through the practice. And so you're kind of releasing that energy. Now the breath is flowing in your body. Now the blood is flowing in your body. When you're doing that downward facing dog, your head is lower than your heart. So you're kind of reversing the blood flow, the effects of gravity. And what happens is literally you're optimizing all the systems in the body. You're optimizing your nervous system. You're optimizing the blood flow, the breath. We talked about it, the brain, all, the heart, all these things. And then when you're in that state of expansion, you liberated that energy because it takes so much energy to kind of be caught up in your stress and in your pain and in your story. And when you freed up that energy, literally, I talked about embodiment. Now you're embodying freedom in your in your body. You can do so much with that liberated energy and use it in a very useful way that benefits you and really benefits everyone around you in the greatest good. I love that. Do you offer online classes? 
Um, I do insight timer on Sundays. That's a yin yoga, de-stress and deep stretch. That's, so that's my online class. And uh, I do the high performance mind, you know, the, my, my leadership trainings. I do that with corporations, but I also offer free master classes on a monthly basis. So every month we meet and I give them kind of like a, a snippet of the high performance mind master class. It's all on yogimaha.com. <laughs> okay. I will put that link in the show note too, but I kind of want to dip back into the serious stuff a little bit again. Okay. Um, uh, I'm curious because of your experience with the traumatic experience that you had with marriage and being in that environment of arranged marriage. And so how has that shaped? And I know that you're a completely different person now than you were then. And so I think sometimes what happens is, well, what I've seen, even in, for me personally and people I've worked with and through grief, um, once you have dealt with all that emotional stuff and the trauma, you kind of, you are changed by it, right? For the positive. And you seem to then attract more of the same to you. Yes. And so how has, I mean, cause I imagine if I would have experienced something like that, I would have been very cynical about love, right? Like, so how has that shaped you today and how you, you know, view it, love and marriage? It, it does shape. And I just want to say that when you heal, it's not that that is completely gone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not like that it's disappeared. It's just that you learn how to, like we said, hold space for it. So it's not kind of blurring your vision. It's not dominating your decision mechanism. Mm -hmm. So it's not leading the way. So you kind of see it, you observe it. It's there. I see you. I know you're still there, uh, but, but it's okay. Kind of like a little child, but it's okay. We got this. We can do this together. Um, so I think that's what's healing. It's that integration, that sense of wholeness. Um, it has shaped my life. I did struggle a lot with relationships. You know, I'm not going to lie to you, Victoria. I struggled a lot with intimacy, love and relationships, especially when it comes to dating. Um, there is this kind of like fear, but you know, I think if you have to choose between love and fear, I think when in doubt, always choose love and always open up to love. You can't go wrong with, with love. There is um, the show I've been kind of watching just like my <laughs> secret indulgence, <laughs> if you will. You know, it's like this, not trashy TV, but reality TV stuff, but, <laughs> but it's called love is blind. And I just find the, the, it's an experiment in love, mm -hmm. but you, you don't meet the people you just mm -hmm. talk mm -hmm. and you be, build this emotional connection mm. before you ever see them. And it really highlights how superficial of a society we really are when we're looking at appearances and you can't, you don't make a decision on love based on, on, um, race, ethnic, you know, race or background or any of those things. It's just yeah. purely an emotional connection. And so, um, has that been how, like, can you speak to that for someone who may be struggling to build that emotional connection with someone? Um, that's a good lead to, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a very interesting question. You know, it's kind of what you mentioned this show the, that they kind of connect on an emotional level before they see each other before on a physical level, um, which is kind of like the opposite of what's happening with dating apps these days. Mm -hmm. Dating apps is purely based on looks, purely based on that snippet, like swipe, 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 super fast, make that decision. Um, I do think that I personally, I'm that kind of person. Um, the advice that I can, I'm the kind of person that I would like to connect more. Like I'd like to know someone more. It's easier to um, open up because if you have these trust issues, like that's what I struggled with. It's when you have that background, like similar to me, what happens is that you don't trust people because the people that were supposed to love you unconditionally violated that trust. And then as you grow as an adult, it's really difficult for you to to find that trust again, especially, you know, with a complete stranger, you know, if my parents didn't love me and take care of me, how is a stranger going to love me and take care of me? So I better watch out, right? That's the mindset. For me, if, if that's something you're struggling with, uh, probably the dating apps are not going to be beneficial to you. Um, 
I would say friendships. You probably want to lean into it through a friendship, through somebody you know, doing what you love. So when you do what you love and you follow your bliss, like Joseph Campbell said, you're going to put yourself in situations to be surrounded with like-minded people and you're going to attract like-minded people. And so you're going to meet those people and it could start off as, you know, colleagues or, you know, friendship, like I said, and you start to have conversation. I feel that creates a safe environment to open up to somebody and be more trustful. And I know that's a slower pace than, you know, what our society teaches us, the swipe, swipe, swipe. But I think it's a very healthy way and it's also more authentic and it's probably going to be a more lasting relationship. You know, when I started, I, I was working right in the corporate world and I wanted, and I just decided to be a yogi and I, and I just made this huge transformation that literally my friends were worried about me. They were, you know, they were doing interventions. Like, what are, are you okay? Like who leaves their corporate job with all the benefits and the big salaries and the fancy offices and, you know, and health insurance and all that stuff. And then you just go live on a yoga teacher's salary. And they thought I was crazy, right? They were worried about me. Are you okay? Literally, I would get text messages. Are you okay? And that was a little bit isolating for me. You know, I felt like no one understood me. But when you true, and it takes a lot of willpower because the calling was so big for me. Like my North Star was so big that the obstacles were small in comparison to the North Star. And so I followed through my passion and, you know, I started to share it with the world and I start to use my voice and speak up, even though it was a big risk, you know, everybody's telling me I'm crazy and I'm going in out there and sharing it with the world. What happened is that people that are like me started to see themselves in me and started to rally around me. And so that's called community. So I started to build community. And I started to be surrounded by like-minded people just because I decided to do what I love and I followed my calling. So the goal was not to meet people. The goal was not to create community. I just felt this calling and I followed my bliss. And then that cascade and leads to other things. It leads. So that's kind of my advice to people is just do what you love and, and the right people will find you. Follow what lights you up, right? Exactly. So what is, well, that's a great tip. And that's, that takes care of that one question I was going to ask. <laughs> um, but what is, what is your grief through all of this? What is your grief taught you? You know, I, like I said, my parents are still alive, but what I had to learn is I had to learn how to support myself. I had to learn how to self-regulate. Um, and what you know that's me and then literally I had when you have nowhere to go you go inside that's what happened to me like my when your face is like in the wall there was nowhere to go but inside and so I went inside and I did the self-work and I did the self-study which allowed me to learn how to be my own best friend and be my the parent that I never had and be my greatest coach and be my best friend and be my greatest lover. So I was able to be all these things and, and it's not an easy journey, but it is such a powerful journey. The results are truly incredible. And so that's when you become whole and that wholeness allowed me to be a better friend for other people, a better lover for another person. And so now I have, because my cup is so full, I'm able to give from my overflow. When your cup is empty, you're no good for anybody around you. And so now I am able to be compassionate really and see people when they're suffering and, and, and just hold space for them and not try to fix it really. I try not to slip into preacher or teacher mode or try to, you know, I'll show you how to fix this, you know, just by holding space for somebody, people want to be seen, people want to be heard, people want to be valued. And so I would say that's what it taught me. Uh, and, and I think that's a very powerful capability to have. I absolutely agree. What gives you the most joy and hope for the future, for your future? Um, I just feel 
what gives, I feel I'm on the right path. I feel I'm on the right place and at the right time. And I feel the more I do this work, the stronger my relationship with my gut feeling is. And so sometimes it doesn't make sense, the decisions that I make, like from an external perspective, from an intellectual perspective, which our culture is very intellectual. Um, and I just make it, and I know that my gut will never lie to me. And so I feel very optimistic because I see that relationship continues to grow and grow um, and, and I trust it more. So I'm really looking forward to the future. Well, and I think that happens as we start to dig away and, and, just clear away all of that stuff. We, we, the, the noise and yeah. the stories. Yeah. It's a lot easier to tap into our intuition when we are able to do that. I think. Yeah. Too. I'm writing my memoir, like I mentioned, and that's been such a cathartic experience for me. And uh, I'm really excited to share that with the world. Do you have a launch date? You know, I think by end of this year. Okay. Yes. I'm we'll really excited about look that. Look out for that. Yes. Is there anything else that you would like to share? Just to, I would don't, I want to say to people, don't give away your power. You are so much more powerful than you think you are. And if you don't believe me, just sit quietly and listen, listen to the voice that is inside of you. And, uh, you know, I'm a meditation teacher and a yoga teacher and all these tools and techniques, they're all just designed to quiet down the noise in your head. So you're able to see things clearly, to hear things clearly. And that alone is such a powerful technique. You know, Victoria, I just saw this documentary. Um, it's an old documentary. There's, there's this experiment in a prison in, in Atlanta or Alabama, I'm sorry, one of those. It's a prison, it's a maximum security prison. And it's like the most, the worst prison in the United States. And they started to deliver Vipassana meditation, which is a silent 10 day meditation. It's, it's the most intense program that anyone can go through to be silent for 10 days. And they did it in Alabama. And, you know, it, it's a, it was a very Christian place and there was a lot of resistance, but, you know, somehow, you know, they, they, rolled out the program and these prisoners are murderers are the worst kind of people you can imagine did horrific things and they did this 10-day meditation of being silent and completely transformed like you can see their faces light up you see them talk before how angry they were and then there's just like this pure peace in their face just because they were able to quiet their head and drop into the body and identify the sensations in the body that are invoking this kind of reaction, this reactive place. And so they, they just learned how to be in their body and how to manage their body and manage their reaction and realize that it's just a chemical reaction and I have the power. You know, I own my body. My body doesn't own me. I own my brain. My brain doesn't own me. I own my emotions. My emotions don't own me. So that's a very empowering tool. And your listeners, you know, they're not murderers. They're not, you know, so their journey can be so much easier and they don't even need to do a 10 day silent meditation. Just sit quietly five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, journal, reflect, go inside, self-study. The more you get to know yourself, the better you're able to serve yourself and serve other people. Yeah, Kristen Sherry has said she's one of my mentors. Um, she has said the more you know yourself, the more you, the less you look to others to tell you who you are. Exactly, and the less validation you need from mm -hmm. others. Yeah, I'm gonna try and find that documentary you're talking about, and I'll put it, that it's in the on show YouTube. Notes. Yeah, Is that it's okay? on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for sharing your story, um, which is incredible. Um, we truly live in a very blessed country and um, yeah, it, we are so lucky that I we agree. take it so for granted. Yeah, yeah. true. Yes. Thank you so much again. And, You're welcome, um, my dear. Yeah. And remember when you unleash your heart, you unleash your life. Much love.